you guys use Skype? Yeah, of course. It's great. It's, I mean, especially if you live far away from your family and friends. It's the main way you keep in touch. Every time I hear it ring, it's just like, great. Someone that I really, really want to talk to. Okay. How many of you use Link? Not so many. Yeah, it's a great program. Um, I've gotten to where I don't even use a desk phone anymore. I actually feel kind of rude calling someone up without looking to see if they're busy, if they're in do not disturb. But I don't feel the same emotional <coughs> that I do whenever I hear Skype ringing. So Microsoft renamed Link back in November to Skype for Business. I have my own theory as to why. You probably have your own theory. So if I fall back to calling it Link, forgive me, it's just a lot easier to say. All right, first of all, who's Amanda Dabler? Well, I'm from Texas, um, but I've been living in Germany the past 11 years. Um, I do Unified Communications Administration, which pretty much means Skype for Business for Shaper Technologies in Herzogenaurach, <coughs> Germany, near Nuremberg. Um, I am not a master PowerShell scripter. I'm a pretty average user. Um, I like to ski, I like to ride my bike, and I like to cook. And you can read my occasionally updated blog at mandy.net, and you can look at what I tweet. Okay, um, so what we're gonna talk about today is Microsoft's Unified Communications past and present. Um, I'm gonna show you how Skype for Business Server and Skype Online fit into this ecosystem. And we're going to get started with the Skype for Business PowerShell module so that you're not just completely out to see when your unified communications team wants help automating stuff. <clears throat> and I'm also going to show you just a few of the tools that the community's already come up with so that you don't duplicate effort unless you really want to duplicate effort. <coughs> And I'll show you the foundations for a home lab so that you can practice with it. Um, however, I must make it very clear that I am not going to begin to show you enough to start doing a real world implementation. Um, if you do end up wanting to have Skype for Business in your office, you probably need to get a consulting firm, especially if you think you might want to use it as a PBX replacement. Okay, a little history. Okay. Anyone remember this? <laughs> yeah. Um, you actually still can find it on the internet, of course. Um, it was last updated in 2007. Um, it used to be a completely unavoidable part of the then completely unavoidable Internet Explorer. And there was no central server for it. I believe they called it multipoint if you had a conversation with more than two people. Okay, um, so the first thing that they did that did have central servers was MSN Messenger and then Live Messenger. Um, that was just a rebranding in there somewhere. And after Microsoft acquired Consumer Skype, uh, they combined people's live messenger accounts with that and eventually phased out the product. It lasted in China a little longer, but I think it's completely gone there now as well. Um, live meeting, on the other hand, it's actually still around. Um, my husband works for Siemens. Actually, daughter company of Siemens, and they actually still use Live Messenger, or Live Meeting, rather. Okay. But they stopped marketing it a long time ago, and it was subscription-based. People did pay for it. 
Okay, now finally, we're at what's now Skype for Business Server. Um, Office Communication Server started out as Live Communication Server. Microsoft loves to rename stuff. Um, one reason I mention this is because a lot of the naming in Lincoln Skype for Business originates from this period. Um, all the command lit names have a CS prefix. Keep that in mind. Um, yeah, it did not have PowerShell support, <coughs> even though Office Communication Server came out after PowerShell v1 was released, came out the same, about the same time that Exchange 2007 did. But anyway, all right, so Link Server 2010 is when Microsoft introduced PowerShell support to their unified communications product. Um, coverage was complete from the beginning. Um, there was nothing that you could do in the web console that you couldn't do in PowerShell. Um, Link Server 2013 restructured the back end a bit, um, added on to the commandlet structure. But if you have a Server 2010 script, it will most likely work with 2013. It might not be necessary anymore, but the commandlets are backward compatible. Um, Link Online, they tried doing a hybrid with on-prem. It didn't go well. Microsoft gave people free help to back out of their hybrid infrastructures. Um, so that was primarily administered through the Office 365 web console, and it had a separate implicit remoting target from on-premises, even when they were trying to do hybrid. Okay, finally, Skype and Skype for Business. Um, the Skype everyone knows about. Um, it was released well over 10 years ago. Um, went through several people, several companies, um, before Microsoft finally got it, and it's what replaced Live Messenger. Okay, um, Skype for Business was announced six, about, no, no, it's closer to a year ago, um, was released four months ago, and it was designed to be hybrid from the beginning, and it uses PowerShell v4, and one thing that we really had to stress to management when they flipped out over the name change was that no, this does not mean that your employees will be Skyping with their friends all day. You have to set up Skype to Skype for business connectivity. It's not accidental. And it got some audio codecs, like why does the Skype call sound so very good even though it's halfway around the world? The Silk Codec and Skype for Business Server has gotten that. <clears throat> and now the client also looks a lot more like consumer Skype. <clears throat> the front end pool is the core of a Skype for Business infrastructure. I'm just going to completely skip. Skype for Business Online because frankly I haven't done that much with it. <clears throat> okay, so this is where users clients sign into. It's also <coughs> where conferences are served out of. The front end pools have SQL Express on them where they cache data in use, but they use the mirrored backend servers to share data, long-term data. When you share a PowerPoint or other Office document in a conference, that is shared via the Office web app server. So don't share your screen when you're sharing a PowerPoint presentation. Post the presentation into your conference and then Users can thumb through it at their own pace. They can collaborate with you on documents. It's pretty great. And 
you only have to have a Windows license for that server. You don't have to have a separate web app server license as long as you're using it with Snack for Business. Okay. Um, if you want your voice users to have voicemail, you have to have an Exchange UM server. Um, that's separate from the Skype for Business server, possibly for legacy reasons, because Exchange has had voicemail capabilities for quite a while. And people's voicemails are stored in their Exchange mailboxes, not on the Skype server. I mentioned phone <coughs> users. PSTN gateway is how Skype for Business gets out to the public telephone network. And this is either a SIP trunk or an E1, T1, whatever connection to the phone company. <coughs> if you have an external conference, external users connect on the conference URL via a reverse proxy. Um, this was TMG until Microsoft discontinued it. Um, we use an F5. Um, if you want to try it out, Kemp offers a 30-day trial on a virtual machine load balancer. And that's really all a reverse proxy is, is a load balancer configured to talk to outside as well. The media traffic passes via the edge server pool. Um, it can either be a single server or it can be a pool of servers. <coughs> and these are firewalls. Okay, so this is a view of that topology in the topology builder. Um, this is the one place where you really can't use PowerShell to administer Skype for Business. Um, <coughs> you used to could publish a topology via the shell, but that is no longer supported. Um, so you put in your pools in the topology builder tool. So you can just start with the central pool, and then you can add the other components later. And then you publish that topology, and that's what informs the rest of your infrastructure that's already there about what's been added. And you finish the installation after you've run the topology builder. Okay, and there are two terms you need to keep in mind when working with Skype for Business users, common area phones, and other endpoints. SIP address, basically an email address, but the domain has to be one of the domains that you have configured for Skype for Business. And of course, it needs to be unique within your organization and therefore globally unique because you can't use someone else's registered domain name. Okay, and then line URI is the Skype for Business term for phone number, um, a phone number in E164 format. That means plus country code and no extraneous zeros. Um, I see a lot of this in our Active Directory phone book. <coughs> that is not an E164 number because of that. So you PowerShell guys will probably be called upon to help clean up the Active Directory phone book entries. Excuse me. 
Okay, so I mentioned the web console. Um, again, the communication server legacy lives on. And it required, you can access it from any client machine within your network, depending on how you have your firewalls set up. Um, it still requires Silverlight. I was kind of surprised. I was expecting them to have gone over to HTML5 and JavaScript. No, they haven't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I actually do use it. Um, if it's voice stuff that, frankly, isn't my job anymore, that I've handed over to the telephony team, if I need to go in and fix a dial plan, I use the web console. It's just a little easier. But you can't do everything in there. Um, the big one is creating and managing common area phones. In fact, we didn't know that common area phones even existed until I started poking around the shell because there is absolutely no mention of them in the web console. What is it? Um, okay, so a common area phone is how you configure an identity for a phone that doesn't really belong to anyone. So a conference room phone, a lobby phone, that sort of thing. Because um, it's been a real conceptual leap for our end users to realize, oh, I can go sit down in the conference room and log in with my phone number and PIN, and now it's my phone. But I can have conferences on it. So we got tasked with assigning discrete phone number, permanent phone numbers to these phones. So that's what the common area phone object is. Yeah. And also shop room floors where the factory workers don't have their own AD accounts because they don't need them. They never send emails. So they just need a phone to be able to call internal services occasionally. Okay. Um, you also, yeah. Is the word policy there referring to a group policy or is this a, in a special? It's a special, it's a special Skype for business object. Yeah. Um, there are several types. I was going to get to that later. Yeah, but, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. No, it's nothing to do with group policy. It is a, yeah, there are several object types around configuration. Yeah, so client policy, conferencing policy. Um, yeah, you can't change the client policy settings from the web console, which is kind of weird. <laughs> yeah, um, because that's the main controller of client behavior. Um, you can only assign ones that you've already made to users. Um, and there's several fine tuning options on the conferencing policy that it's only accessible from the shell. Um, some of the networking configuration is only available from the shell, as well as defining holiday sets for response groups. Um, that's kind of a glaring omission because response group administration otherwise is a task you can delegate out to non-specialists. You can set a response group manager who otherwise is the department secretary. And you normally wouldn't expect to be able to start an implicit remoting to the management shelf. And there's some stuff that I, even I still do in both, um, managing response groups. Um, there are more options for the response group object in the shell. But a lot of them require constructing a strange special Skype for Business object that is completely not obvious from the command lit help. And I had to do a little git membering to realize, oh, there is a special object for how you set up call forwarding options for response groups. And don't get me started on call forwarding options for regular users because Skype for Business does not do a very good job of that. There's something called Cepha Util, and it's horrible. 
if you can write a better Cepha util, you will be a star in this community, but there are a lot of guys trying. So what I do, I bulk create the response groups in PowerShell, and then I or the voice administrators who aren't hardcore scripter types, they update in web console as needed. They'll set up the specific forwarding for numbers for each response group. <coughs> okay, so you can install the tools locally on any modern Windows server or even client OS. And they just, you have to have the whole Skype for Business install ISO. So yeah, you have to go download a 1.5 gig <coughs> ISO in order to get Skype for Business shell. And really, you only run, a, run those locally in reality if you're a domain admin. I'm not a domain admin. The day that my account got taken out of domain admin was one of the best days of my life. It's like, yes, I no longer have this responsibility on my shoulders. So, and a lot of worry here. Remote-based admin control is <coughs> fairly similar to the way it is in Exchange, same general concepts, but it only wor really works with implicit remoting. So, like Exchange, it only imports the commands that the user's role allows. Um, for example, the CS user administrator, if a user's only in that group, they wouldn't even get the new CS PSTN usage or new CS voice policy commandlets because those commands are only for the full CS administrator and the CS voice administrator. So people who make and handle user objects or in the CS user administrator AD group. But my telephone guys who make dial plans, set up voice routes, they're in CS voice administrator. And another nice thing about the way role-based admin controls are, the users don't have direct access to the Skype related AD attributes or any other AD attributes via the role. So they can't accidentally set something the wrong way. Uh, yeah, the CS administrator can make new CS common area phone objects and the related Active Directory properties will get updated, but they don't actually do that directly in Active Directory. You don't have to give them access. <clears throat> and this is just how you connect. Um, I had the bright idea that, oh, we can have a Skype for Business admin server and people can connect to that instead of the front end servers. No, it doesn't work that way. You can only start that PS session with a front-end server or a director server. Um, you might still could have your admin server because director server does not require a Skype for Business server license. Front-end server does. So, yeah, you may or may not get buy-in from your management to set up a full front-end pool just for managing. <coughs> So, getting to the core of my presentation halfway through. Okay, um, users and contacts. Um, so, all of the endpoint objects in Skype for Business Server are anchored to something in Active Directory. Um, in the case of the CS user, regular user with a desktop client, maybe a mobile client, that's connected to an Active Directory user object, of course. Um, the CS meeting room, those really cool smart boards, those are CS meeting rooms. And 
again, Active Directory user object that you need to create before you can enable it as a CS meeting room. On the other hand, contacts, um, the common area phone I've been babbling about, that's actually an Active Directory contact. There's no user object. Good thing because, yeah, an account that no one really owns is kind of dangerous. Yeah, that just authenticates to Skype for Business. It does not authenticate to Active Directory. <clears throat> and then there's the analog device, which represents a fax or a phone that for some reason you just cannot convert to an IP phone. Um, I work for a big auto parts manufacturer. There's some equipment that just has to have an analog phone line. Tell Skype about it with analog device. Why do you need it? What's it? Mm -hmm. Pardon? Why, why do you need why does it need to be represented if it's going to be analog? Um, if you for some reason need to be able to forward to it. Okay. Um, or for your IP gateway. So you route your analog data through the SIP? Um, yeah, so usually what, we, what we've done so far with the analog devices we have to connect, um, we've got audio codes gateways and they sell an extra module that you connect to the gateway and you connect your legacy devices to. And then you configure the routing in the gateway. Yeah, and again, I'll reiterate, we have help for that because, yeah, there's no way we can set up gateways without external help <clears throat> because connecting to the PSTN or SIP trunk is a little different in every country. Yeah, we learned that the hard way. <sighs> okay. Um, some Active Directory attributes that are should be interesting to you if you're going to be working with Skype for Business. Um, all of the attributes that Link or Skype for Business add to Active Directory have MSRTC SIP as a prefix. And it's kind of nice for searching and for reading. Um, we use it on our gateways for routing help. The gateway connects to just reads Active Directory and chooses whether to route the call to Skype or to our legacy PBX. Don't write to those attributes. Theoretically, you can enable someone for Skype for Business by filling those in correctly in Active Directory. It's a very bad idea because stuff doesn't get written to the backend database in the right order if you do that. Um, proxy addresses is kind of important to watch out for as well because the user's SIP address needs to match an SMTP address that's already in there or that you put in there when you make the SIP address. Skype for Business does not take care of that for you. Um, and if you mismatch the case, you'll get all sorts of very strange errors on the servers. Again, it will work pretty much, but you'll just get some strange errors whenever they try to change their own call forwarding. Also important to remind your help desk about is that you can't change their SIP address by just changing the SIP entry in their proxy addresses. That drove us crazy, trying to figure out what was going on with that. Um, turned out our help desk, staffers, were just trying to be helpful, trying to take care of matters themselves. Whenever people were having name changes, yeah, don't do that. Okay. Um, Here's how you can use the MSRTC SIP line and private line to search for the existence of a phone number. So 
this would be particularly useful when you're assigning a new phone number to check to make sure that phone number is not already assigned to someone else. It's a little messy in the Active Directory module because you have to also search the configuration container. You can search Active Directory directly from the Skype for Business module with get CSAD principle. And the reason we're using AD principle and not AD user is that we don't know what kind of object that phone number might be assigned to. Okay, and then there is a short list of all the endpoint types. Um, the major ones, of course, are CS user, CS common area phone, CS analog device, and then RGS workflow is the response group, or as the telephone guys used to call it, hunt group, or IVR. Um, dialing conferencing number. Um, this binds to the Exchange UM phone number, which you configure in Exchange, not here. Um, a trusted application endpoint is for your custom application. Um, that too can, must have a SIP address and can have a phone number. And then finally, CS meeting room, those really cool smart boards. Most of them have an in command lit filter, pretty much like Exchange. Response groups don't, so then you have to do a where clause filter, which as you guys all know, much slower. Most of them take domain controller so that you can know which domain controller you're using. Um, that's more important in a set than a get, but in our environment, I've found that picking a domain controller at the site I'm at means this runs in under a minute with 45,000 users, and it runs in five minutes if I take one in Asia. If I don't specify the domain controller, it's kind of potluck, even though we've got 80 sites and subnets set up, but it will just randomly pick a domain controller if you don't tell it one. Um, unfortunately, Common Area Phone does not have a domain controller parameter. Yes? How do these things work in a multi-domain forest? Because you can specify domain controller, can you specify credentials if I want to check something in a child domain, or does Link not, or Skype, or whatever we're calling it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, whatever we're calling it right now. Yeah. Okay, well, let me think a second, because we've only been seriously using it since we consolidated to one domain. Um, actually, yeah, it does work. Uh, Cross them because, yeah. I mean, I know the, the AD command has yeah. ways where you can do cross domain right. administration. I just wondered if these command lists had a similar way. I think what will happen is it'll hit the global catalog and then it'll just look for users that have linked properties on it. So yeah. regardless of the domain, they're going to be in the global catalog. Can yeah. you specify a port catalog server for domain controller? Yeah, can you do with a port? Is it a port? For GC on the like colon yeah. and then port number. Uh, I don't know. I I'll check. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll check. That, that's Can an interesting run question. LDAP queries as well, or does it only use PowerShell queries? Uh, filters. I mean. Um. Is there like a minus LDAP filter? Not a? not in the commandlets. No, I don't think for, so. For the ones that you're showing there, those are. Just Dash filter, not dash LDAP. Yeah, and actually, and even dash filter has its limits. It's not all. And see, note that that's not an AD attribute. That's a Skype for Business attribute on the Skype for Business object. And yeah, actually, that goes via the database because you can also, for example, I can filter on people who have maximum conferencing. So I can do dash filter, conferencing policy, EQ, 
maximum conferencing and that requires a trip to the database because it's not stored like that in Active Directory. Um, in Active Directory, it's stored as a table, of, let me see, a hash table of policies. And I can't remember which attribute that is, but you can't, yeah, so it, yeah, so I think that it's making a trip to the link database anyway. Is any of this exposed through PS Drive? Or just the commands? Uh, like an active directory when you install the module and you get an AD PS Drive? You know what? I have no idea because I can't remember the last time that I used no. it. Yeah. No. I was like, I didn't think so. I didn't yeah. think so, but yeah, it's kind of weird. I I never really got into using the PS drives as much. I don't know why that just it's never the way I rolled. Yeah. Um, I'm just looking at these, but um, get CS common area phone does have a domain controller parameter. It just doesn't work. Is that the problem? Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't really because when I do it at the command line, it just doesn't do any like. Right. 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 Yeah, it doesn't it's come a security up. Feature. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, that, report that. Let let those folks know. Okay. You know, file a connect bug or something like that because if there's a parameter and it's not functioning the way it's intended to, that's. You know, that's not your problem, that's their problem. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and then that brings me to, because that was from Paul Vallant's script for get link numbers. Um, and yeah, it's a nice place to turn back to to see which ones support filter and which ones don't. Um, and then Stolle Hansen built a very useful tool if you're doing Skype for Business Voice, get dash SFB numbers. And that takes Paul's script, but it also combines it with Guy Buchar and Yoav Barzile's get linked orphaned users. Um, get linked orphaned users is a convenient way to read the backend database to see who hasn't logged in to link within a certain amount of time and yet has a phone number or who has a link phone number assigned but is not currently enabled for enterprise voice or has a link phone number assigned and their active directory accounts disabled so they're obviously not using their phone number that sort of thing and also brings in some nice html reporting HTML pie charts, not HTTP pie charts. Sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, so there is no new CS user. Um, you can kind of tell with the Skype for Business endpoint objects whether you need to have an anchor and active directory before making it by seeing if there's a new whatever. Um, so. Yeah, if there's no new CS user, you have to have an active, you have to have an existing AD user object that is currently enabled. Um, what that really means is you can't take a shared mailbox that's disabled and enable it for voice. I know, that's what, that's what I said. <laughs> Sub June. Yeah, and we actually tried temporarily enabling it in Active Directory, enabling it in Link, giving it a phone number, setting up voicemail for it in Exchange, and then disabling the user object again. It worked for a little while, but then within a few hours, it stopped working. So you've got your whiteboard objects and stuff. So they're active AD user objects. Pardon? Is, it, is that only for voicemail? So you're talking about say you have user objects for your whiteboards and stuff. Okay, yeah. Um, actually, the, yeah. The whiteboard account has to be an active, has to be enabled in Active Directory because the whiteboard authenticates directly to Active Directory. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, so you can't take an existing shared mailbox and set it up for voicemail. Yeah. So 
that was kind of painful. We wasted a fair amount of a day figuring that one out because again, it worked for a little while, but then eventually stopped working. Yeah. Okay, and there's three things you absolutely have to have for that user. You have to have his identity, so that existing Active Directory object. Um, you need a SIP address and one that you're not already using in your environment. Um, Skype for Business will throw an error, so you won't accidentally create two accounts with the same SIP address. Um, and then finally, registrar pool, that's where you tell it which front end pool this user is going to be logging into and having his conferences in. Um, if in, you're in a big enough environment that you have pools around the world, users should be homed in the pool nearest them. <clears throat> and you can move users between pools, so it's not a big deal. Okay, looks like I'm getting close. Okay, um, and this is just how you enable one. Okay, uh, there's a few things you can do with set CS user, mostly around setting their line URI. But there's a lot of stuff you can't do with that, and that's the policies. So you assign an already configured policy with grant, CS, whatever policy, identity, and the, the user, and then the policy name, so maximum conferencing, and then dash pass through if you want the object outputted. Because I can't remember who mentioned that sometimes the sign of success with the Azure module is that you don't see anything. Yeah, that's also with branding policies in Lincoln Skype for Business. So I like to put pass through on the end just as a confirmation. Um, client policy controls client behavior. Do they download the address book and cache it or do they make web queries? What's their hot desking for being logged into a desk phone? Um, client version policy is how you can block out old OCS clients. Or, for example, if you don't want people connecting with the iOS mobile client because it's got a huge bug or something, you can make a client version policy that blocks all the iOS clients. Just for example, there's not a huge bug with it currently, but at one point there was. Um, conferencing policy um, covers both things you would think of as conferencing, like how many participants they are allowed to have in a conference, um, whether they can dial out of the conference, but also some peer-to-peer -peer stuff, things you would think of as peer-to-peer, -peer, like individual desktop sharing, for instance. That's controlled in conferencing policy. Um, voice policy defines what numbers people are allowed to call and what gateways they are allowed to use for calling those numbers. And dial plan determines how short numbers they dial are interpreted into longer E164 numbers. And finally, you set up voicemail in exchange with enable UM mailbox. And you already need to have the user in Skype for Business in order to do that and get it to work right if you've got Skype for Business in your environment. Okay, um, I'm going to scoot along to the end. Whew. Okay, so we're going to skip sites and subnets. Okay, finally, yes? No, no, no. Move it. Okay, I'm, I am finishing. Okay, so anyway. So I was warning you guys, okay, I'm not gonna tell you enough to be able to deploy this for real, get consulting help, but there's plenty of stuff that you can try on your own and will be useful for you if you eventually do end up with Skype for Business, even if you're not the one who's gonna be primarily administering it. 
So, since I see a lot of MVPs and other people who probably have some Azure credit maybe sitting around, um, you can build a full test lab in Azure, including Edge, um, because for a while you couldn't do the Edge role because it requires two NICs that are on separate subnets. But now you can. Um, you can even get one of those free for 30 day Kemp load balancers I was talking about to do your reverse proxy. Um, yeah, and theoretically you could use it for real, but that is really, really not supported. Um, because we thought about trying to do edge in the cloud and a guy from Microsoft Consulting Deutschland who was on a Azure call with us was like, oh sure, that sounds awesome. I'll help you get that set up. And then we had our Skype for business call with that team the next day. And they said, no, you can't. Absolutely not. So anyway, there went that bright idea. Okay, and finally, your minimum why, buy. Why not? It's a performance issue or? Uh, it's performance. Maybe. Yeah, latency, they can't guarantee that, I mean, even if you have express route, they can't guarantee that it's going to be good enough for you to be happy with it. But it's perfectly fine for home lab. It will work. So, okay. Yeah. That's just bullshit. Skype online works fine. So why shouldn't uh, Azure VM work fine? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can, yeah, let's say if... if if you're wanting to just use it in the cloud, yeah, do Skype online. Don't bother building your own environment. But yeah, if you want to build an environment in order to learn about it, then it's possible to do in Azure. And this is more or less my minimum test lab at work on a mid-size server or mid-size workstation. Um, really, you just need the first two. You need a domain controller, and then you need a second Windows 2012 R2. And the Set for Business 2015 ISO is free, from down, free for download from TechNet, and you're allowed to use it for 180 days in a lab. So anyway, and then if you want to work on the voicemail part, you'll need an Exchange 2013 server. <coughs> and if you want to play with the reporting, a small SQL server. But you can definitely do that all within eight gigs of RAM. It'll be very slow, but you can. <laughs> OK, so anyway, uh, does anyone have any questions? Nope. Okay, thank you. Thank you.